Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Andrew Shire, the Director of Client Solutions here at Catalyst Solutions. Uh, we are pleased to be hosting our webinar today, uh, Solving Your Key Operational Challenges Through BPO Outsourcing. Uh, our speaker today is Mr. Scott Martin. He is the president of Catalyst Solutions. Uh, Scott, he has over 25 years of health plan experience, both on the payer and provider sides. Uh, his experience spans the operational, clinical, and IT areas of the health plan. What are the challenges that healthcare plans are currently facing and how some of those challenges can be, can be helped through, through the use of through outsourcing? Uh, so quick covering of the content, and we have a, we have a full, full agenda for you today. Uh, we want to talk about you know, healthcare plan operational challenges. Uh, what does that mean from an operational cost perspective? What does that look like from a workforce engagement and resiliency perspective? Uh, talk about technology challenges, consumer engagement challenges. I want to spend a minute talking about the history of the BPO. Uh, I don't think everyone really understands how pervasive it is, you know, through, through many of the verticals, uh, not including necessarily healthcare. Then we'll talk about the, the solutions and benefits that the BPO gives, um, how it can help from a labor perspective, how it can help eliminate certain commodity services, uh, talk about some of the benefits to a technology perspective that the BPO can provide, and also how it can help with, uh, with consumer engagement. And a couple things just to start off, I want to talk about Catalyst Solutions. Um, we are uh, a, an organization that is explicitly focused on the healthcare plan. We, we don't go into any other markets. We are experts in healthcare. Uh, we have deep expertise in the space of technology, operations, human performance and training, and then management consulting. As an organization, we're diversity certified and we're woman owned. Uh, we partner with clients from all lines of business and our clientele is across the country, ranging from startup plans to plans in excess of 25 million members. Quickly, we want to talk about, as an organization, how does Catalyst uh, differentiate itself? Number one, we bring industry expertise to the table. We know how payers work. Uh, folks like myself uh, who work for Catalyst uh, have, have 25 years of experience. Uh, we, we, we understand the, the, the dynamics of, of the payer space. We focus on service. We're not satisfied unless you're satisfied. Uh, and most importantly, I would say lastly that our purpose is to make healthcare better. We are very focused on, on serving the communities in which we live and the communities in which you live. Uh, we are trying to make healthcare better uh, so that everyone can have healthier healthcare outcomes. What are the operational challenges for a healthcare plan? As an industry, healthcare has undergone enormous changes over the past several years. And this trend is going to continue. The landscape is dynamic. There are new challenges on the horizon. We're seeing lots of mergers, acquisition partnerships, and these are occurring at, at a previously unprecedented rate. Uh, there are new players uh, and they're very disruptive. Apple, Google, Amazon, they're all entering the market. And of course, the government uh, continues to introduce mandates to which healthcare plans must adhere. Uh, all of these factors add demands on the healthcare plans. Healthcare plans that are already facing budgetary and resource constraints. So just like organizations in any other vertical, they're focused on driving down costs and focusing on what is most important. And, and in, in healthcare, that's improving the outcomes or the healthcare outcomes of their members. Um, so what we've done is we've broken down the, the challenges facing a healthcare plan into kind of four high level categories. So we're, we're looking at operational challenges, technological challenges, regulatory compliance and mandate challenges, and then new challenges, things that, that really don't fall into any other category. Taking a look at, at budgetary challenges. So <clears throat> overall, you know, just looking across the, the, the entire payer spectrum, administrative cost is about $160 billion burden in our industry. <clears throat> Next, consumerism. Healthcare plans are, are placing increased responsibility on the membership, which 
as a result, drives up calls to the to the call center, uh, affecting both you know the call center side. I'm sorry, the, the the customer side, the membership side, and on the provider side. Uh, and those increased call volumes result in increased cost to the plan. We're making a transition from from vo excuse me volume to value. <clears throat> um, we're experiencing challenges related to Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, and as it relates to the exchanges, the higher risk pools, uh, there are higher risk pools and, and more costly claims. Um, <clears throat> lastly, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, there's also an increased challenge in managing the medical loss ratio. Uh, as you know, 80% uh, of plan dollars need to be allocated for medical spend and 20% allocated to administrative spend. And then finally, as far as you know, premium management and premium collection, um, not collecting the right premiums uh, for certain conditions, we'll talk about this in just a second, adversely affect the plan's bottom line. So these are, these are very serious budgetary challenges. <clears throat> there are workforce engagement and resiliency challenges. So just to speaking kind of in, in, in recent history, the coronavirus pandemic has impacted all sectors of the economy uh, in, in, in both 2020 and in 2021. All businesses in, across the country, across the world, have seen their supply chains interrupted. They've seen uh, demand for certain products and services decline. We've seen shortages in supplies. Um, we've seen government closures of, of businesses and schools. And at the same time, the federal government has implemented programs designed to help keep those impacted employees on payrolls. <clears throat> There's also some interesting data that's really kind of coming out of, of this experience uh, and, and, and its effect on, on the healthcare industry. So, so number one, um, women uh, have exited the, the workforce at a much higher rate than men and, and, and largely uh, it has been kind of uh, posited that this is related to childcare responsibilities and school closures. Uh, we have seen with our clients that uh, attrition rates are increasing, especially around workers resisting mask and, van uh, and vaccine mandates. <clears throat> uh, this dovetails into the fact that, and everyone has heard it, the, the, the great resignation, uh, an average of Almost 4 million, 3.9 million workers quit their jobs each month in 2021. And, and in the healthcare industry, turnover rates have been as high as 3.6%. So it's almost 4% turnover in our industry. And I think one of the things that we've learned from this is that during the pandemic, a lot of the workers are, are looking for increased desire for telecommuting. They don't want to come into the office anymore. Either they, they become accustomed to, to the benefit uh, of being a telecommuter. Uh, there's a lot of benefits associated with that. Um, it's provided a, a greater flexibility in schedule. Um, and that greater flexibility in schedule then dovetails into a greater work-life balance. <clears throat> Moving into the technology space. <clears throat> um, many plans are on outdated technologies. Uh, many vendors require that plans update their platforms on a prescribed schedule in order to stay compliant with the vendor contracts. <clears throat> there are challenges related to cybersecurity. <clears throat> given, given the sensitivity of PHI, the impact of a breach on a plan could be catastrophic. <clears throat> so, so there's also a new push into the, the data and analytics space. Right now, uh, if you look at the period just between 2014 and 2018, healthcare plans have invested almost $40 billion in, in improving their, their ability to get, control, and understand the, the data at their disposal. These plans want to use data to improve clinical quality performance. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that is that getting these key drivers, getting these key data elements is, is a huge component of improving their star rating, which to the plan is a driver of plan revenue. Additionally, better data allows the plan to have insights into 
causes and effects related to plan spend and, 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 and cost to the plan. And, and one of the things in this space, and I think this is a, a key factor in, in, in the $40 billion spend that, that, that has occurred, is that many other verticals uh, have been using data analytics for, for a decade, and in some cases more. It's really in its infancy in, in, in the healthcare space, especially for the insurer side of the equation. So in a lot of cases, healthcare plans are, are starting to build that framework right now uh, they're starting to kind of understand how does it how does it happen that a healthcare plan becomes data driven, becomes data centric. That infancy is 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 a driver in in complexity and challenge. There are also new technologies entering the market, uh, and I think two of the most exciting ones that healthcare plans are struggling with is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, these are tools that are available to us that allows uh, the, the machine to, to do thinking that a human doesn't have to do, to do thinking at a speed much faster than a human could do, to, to find trends in data that no human, just given the, the volumes of data that are available, no human could ever hope to find. Healthcare plans are now looking at introducing artificial intelligence and machine learning in, in many core functions of the healthcare plan. For example, claims processing. Uh, how do you improve payment accuracy? So a lot of healthcare plans strive to optimize their configuration, but at a certain point, configuration is only gonna take them so far. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to take us the rest of the way. Uh, and that's helpful in reducing costs because then you don't need claims adjudicators to really manually process some of these claims if, if the machine learning or the artificial intelligence can say, hey, I know how a human would process this. I can do this without human intervention. It's going to be helpful for managing prior authorizations. It's going to be very helpful in, in audit and quality assurance. Um, the, the, especially in the case of machine learning, the machine learning is going to look at every transaction. So right now, in, in many plans, you know, when we talk about you know, audit, we're looking at a 3% sample of, of a total pool of, of productivity but a 3% or a 5% might not be statistically significant. It might not be indicative of, of a trend. Uh, using machine learning, we can audit 100% of volume, 100% of transactions, and, and that will be much better in identifying, are things working appropriately? What is our productivity? What is our accuracy? <clears throat> uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence can be inserted into call centers, helping with call routing, uh, intelligent call routing, and in chatbots where the, the robot can basically have preliminary conversations with the human, thereby precluding the need for a customer service rep to do some of the more remedial, high volume, low complexity tasks of a call center. Um, it can help with payment forecasting. Uh, it will be extremely helpful in fraud, waste, and abuse pr uh, prevention. Uh, Artificial intelligence, like I said earlier, is able to identify trends that even the most diligent of humans can't find. And they'll be able to do it on a regular basis. And, and the, the avoidances or the savings in this space are going to be enormous. And then also uh, as a way of automating billing, uh, another opportunity to, to remove humans from uh, high volume, low complexity work. The, the regulatory environment is complex, it's ever changing. Administrative activities related to regulatory compliance in the healthcare payer space resulted in about three, I'm sorry, $39 billion in annual spend. If you think about it, every time a regulation comes out, it, it, it's some kind of internal or external professional evaluation to understand how is this going to affect our organization and how we do our business. That could then lead to the necessity of a, of a process redesign. It could lead to the necessity of a system redesign. And, and what we know is some plans can spend in the neighborhood of, of $700,000 on an annual basis investing in IT systems and trying to achieve compliance. <clears throat> Once these processes and systems are implemented, uh, there's going to be a testing uh, mechanism that has to occur to make sure it works. 
And then from an implementation perspective, there, there's a whole suite of activities that the healthcare plan is going to have to pay for. <clears throat> you have to train your staff. You have to send out communications and ensure that, that you know, processes are known not only within your organization, but in some cases, they have to be communicated with, with vendors and partners. And, and in the regulatory space, <clears throat> the, the penalties uh, and fines for non-compliant can have a, a, a substantial, they can have a, a significant impact on the bottom line of a healthcare plan. Uh, we have seen, uh, I have seen in, in the course of my 25 years in the industry, um, healthcare plans being dinged by CMS in the ballpark of, of millions of dollars. Uh, so, so these are not trivial uh, implications uh, to a healthcare plan. Uh, this is a huge challenge, and, and keeping up with it is, is a, a huge challenge. Next on our list are the new challenges, right? Uh, we're seeing an influx of providers entering the payer space. Uh, we're seeing various provider groups consolidating. We're seeing rises in employer self-insured plans. And we're seeing new technologies, very much like uh, machine learning and, uh, and, and artificial intelligence. <clears throat> We're seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Over the last five to 10 years, um, mergers and acquisitions have become very intense. Uh, just quickly, if you, if you, if you think about the, the things that we've seen in the last probably two to three years, there have been some very, very you know, uh, notable uh, mergers and acquisitions. And I, we just shared a, a small list of those on the screen. On top of that, um, there have been some new players into the market from a next generation payer perspective that are acting as disruptors. They're, they're looking at the healthcare payer system and saying, is there a different way to approach this? Is there, is there a better way, a smarter way, a more effective way to approach this? And at the exact same time, <clears throat> whereas in the past technology firms tended to stay away from the healthcare space given its complexity, a lot, of, uh, a lot of technology vendors are now entering that space. We've seen Amazon uh, take steps into this space. We've seen you know, Google Alphabet enter this space. Apple has entered this space. IBM has entered this space, especially from a, a data and analytics perspective. Microsoft has entered this space and Samsung, more on the provider side, but Samsung has entered this space. So there's a lot of technology firms that are also acting as disruptors that as a healthcare plan, you know, we, we need to kind of get ahead of these things. So, so at, at, a, at, a, at a super superficial summary of what are the issues facing healthcare plans, that's a relatively quick synopsis. So, so the question becomes is, how do healthcare plans meet these challenges? The answer is business process outsourcing. For those of you who, who understand BPO or maybe are not as familiar with BPO, BPO is business process outsourcing, and it's the, it's the business practice in which an organization contracts with an external service provider to perform an essential business task. And, and when we talk about, you know, what is a, an essential business task? When you look at the healthcare plan, there, there are things that the plan does that give them a, a competitive edge, right? They, they, they're a differentiator in the marketplace. It's an activity or, or activities that provide value to the member or the provider. Uh, activities that improve uh, healthcare outcomes. Uh, and, and, and these are things that need to be the healthcare plan's core focus. It needs to be their center of circle. On the other hand, uh, there are activities that the plan must do, but these activities don't differentiate the organization. They, they don't provide a, a competitive advantage. These processes are, are called commodity or commodity services. And these kind of services are honestly best left to outsourcing vendors. One of the things that we can say is that, that healthcare plans that have been most successful have, have focused on their core processes, their core products, their core differentiators. That's their competitive advantage. Anything that is not part of their core business, they've outsourced. So let's talk about the, the history of, of outsourcing. So 
going back as far as the 19th century, even, even before the 19th century, going back to the Industrial Revolution, um, companies have grappled with how can they exploit the, their competitive advantage? How do they increase their market share? How do they increase their profit? The model for most of the 20th century was focused on, on large integrated companies that own, manage, and directly control all of their assets. Uh, that trend largely continued into the 1950s and 60s, where there was a push for diversification, where there was a push to to broaden corporate bases and, and really take advantage of economies of scale. But, but what we found was uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s, organizations were now competing globally, but the, the economies of scale that they grew to achieve were, were really hampering their ability to be agile. Uh, they, had, they had bloated management structures. They, they were highly inefficient because they weren't focusing on what they were best at. They weren't focusing on their, on their one thing. So to increase their flexibility, to increase their, their creativity, many large companies, especially in manufacturing, and a lot of what we've learned over the past 50 years has been in, from, from manufacturers doing these things, they outsourced their labor to foreign countries in order to cut costs. In the 1980s, uh, a lot of IT companies, this is really kind of at the start of the IT boom, they began outsourcing what they considered non-essential functions. They would outsource data entry, they would outsource payroll, they would outsource their legal. It wasn't what they were good at and there was someone else who could do it smarter, better, faster. Uh, the most noteworthy event of these was in 1989, uh, Kodak outsourced most of its IT systems, um, and that became an impetus for a lot of other organizations to start outsourcing IT, which consequently means that in the early 2000s and, and up through today, businesses are now increasingly outsourcing commodity services to suppliers, uh, either to inside their company or outside of their company. Uh, and, and the terms that they typically use are offshoring and, and nearshoring. And we'll talk about that in just a second. <clears throat> Let's talk about the, the, the benefits of what a BPO brings to a healthcare plan. So healthcare plans have been slow adopters of outsourcing. Um, and, and that tide is changing. So Economically, you know, the, the, the three big points here are you're going to see cost reduction, you're going to see cost savings, and, and lastly, you're going to see capital investment reduction. You're also going to see improvements in the operational space. Uh, and that's because when you talk about operations, these are largely commodity services, and commodity services are the focus of a BPO vendor. A BPO vendor can achieve an economy of scale that a plan cannot. A BPO vendor focuses on, on, on a select set of activities. They, they do claims, they do call center. And because that is their single focus, this creates a workforce resiliency that the, that the plan cannot match. Uh, additionally, because it's the one thing that they do, uh, <clears throat> they can, they're, they're much better at mitigating the effects of things like staffing shortages and turnover. Uh, additionally, BPOs bring expertise because they are, their core focus, their one thing is, is managing things like productivity and accuracy. <clears throat> uh, these operational benefits allow the plan to focus on its core capabilities, which helps them improve their business focus, which allows them to achieve a competitive advantage. That drives customer satisfaction. And hopefully, uh, if, the, if the plan is appropriately focused, it also drives improved member health outcomes, which is, which is really what we all want from our healthcare system is for our healthcare system to keep people healthy. From a strategic perspective, <clears throat> um, you know, when we look at you know, strategically, uh, again, there's an opportunity for business process reengineering, right? There are things that you can now move over to the BPO partner that you don't have to focus on so you can re-engineer your business. You can focus on your core competencies. You can also focus on your, your being flexible and agile 
in, in how you deliver. <clears throat> and then lastly, um, is, is kind of circling back to healthcare outcomes, a lot of healthcare plans are, are starting to outsource um, clinical aspects of, of their business to, to BPO providers. <clears throat> so, so in that vein, um, you know, through, through proactive BPO vendor outreach, uh, plans can actively engage, manage at-risk uh, individuals. Uh, they can help uh, prevent any health risks from escalating, which again, if we can prevent that, right, we're, we're helping people lead healthier lives. We're, we're, we're preventing uh, those folks that we know who have chronic conditions uh, from, from having episodes, because we know that those episodes, if prevented, uh, help us avoid, you know, costly hospital admissions and, and costly hospital readmission. How does the BPO provide these benefits? So we, we are talking about scale of economy. So if, if we think about a healthcare plan for just a second, and, and let's think about a small healthcare plan and their call center. So, so based on the membership of the call center, um, let's say using an Erlang calculator. And for those of you who are not familiar with an Erlang calculator, um, it's, it's, a, it's a tool that allows you to calculate how many resources would you need based on certain known kind of peaks and valleys in, in, in both daily and, and seasonal variations for inbound call volumes. So if we said, hey, for this small healthcare plan, I need two two call center agents, but that's not necessarily true because we're not accommodating for things like, you know, uh, shrinkage. So uh, one of our call center agents had to go have lunch. They had to go have their break. Uh, it's not accounting for sick time. It's not accounting for, for vacation time. Um, so, so the healthcare plan then has to kind of make their workforce more resilient, which means they might have to add another two resources or, or, or maybe, another three resources, bringing their total headcount to, to four or five. And that really doubles the cost or, or over doubles the cost of their call center. In, in the case of a BPO, what they do is call center. Because they have that scale of economy, they can negate the cost of shrinkage and, 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 and save or sorry, uh, pass that cost avoidance back to the customer, right? If you're doing call center work for, for several plans, you, the, the, the impact of shrinkage is, is much reduced uh, to the BPO, which is the, the benefit of scale of economy. Uh, next, expertise. Just like the healthcare plan focuses on what it does best, BPOs focus on those commodity services. Um, because they, they focus on those commodity services, they have expertise in recruiting and retaining the right talent. They have the expertise in providing specialized training. They do one thing, they train their people one way, they, they get a best practice out of it. Their training department doesn't have to support the entire organization. It focuses on call center, it focuses on claims. Um, and, and, and it's very hard for a healthcare plan to, to replicate that level of specialization, that level of expertise. Uh, and then it's also worth mentioning um, that one of the benefits of, of outsourcing is the ability to, to offshore or nearshore. Um, <clears throat> there is a large uh, wage differential between US workers and, and lower cost overseas workers. Um, in some cases, labor costs are often 70% uh, uh, of, of the net costs uh, for, for an offshore organization. And, and, and the delta between the cost of a U.S. worker and an overseas worker is really attractive to organizations like healthcare plans seeking to lower costs. Uh, you know, if, you, if you look at you know, who are the kind of top 20 providers you know, of, of offshore services, I mean, some of the, some of the answers um, don't surprise us, right? You know, um, yeah, but some of them I think are interesting. We're, we're, we're seeing, you know, not not just an increase in in you know places that we would expect like Asia, but we're also seeing, you know, a, a growth in areas that are closer to nearshore, such as you know uh, Central and, and and South America, 
Uh, we're seeing growth in, in you know, parts of Europe and in Eastern Europe, places where um, you know, they're really capitalizing on their ability to, to provide service at a lower, at a lower price point. Let's talk about, when, when, we, when, we, when we talk about what are the commodity services that a BPO can provide, uh, from an operations perspective, obviously, uh, claims is at the top of the list. Uh, and I would actually bundle configuration uh, into that list as well. When you bundle claims and configuration, uh, the, the BPO then has skin in the game uh, to, to make sure that they're optimizing the configuration because that optimized configuration will then result in less resources having to do that work. So those two generally go hand in hand. Um, <clears throat> the same thing with call center, you know, um, and, and one of the things that's been interesting from a, from a call center perspective is that, um, especially as it ties to the clinical piece, Outreach, uh, especially from a clinical perspective, has been hugely beneficial. Um, with, with the recent COVID uh, pandemic, uh, call centers uh, that have reached out to, to uh, members to, to get vaccines uh, have shown uh, an 18% increased likelihood of those people who might not have been inclined to get a vaccine to actually get the vaccine. And, and when you then kind of take a look at that from, from a, you know, a, a member health outcome perspective and a cost perspective, the total cost of outreach to the entire body of membership is actually the same cost of an individual succumbing to COVID and then requiring ICU treatment. So, so there's, a, there's a huge cost benefit there. Um, another space where I think call centers have been really interesting is as, as government programs are increasing, as, as uh, plans are now required to meet CMS guidelines for, for call center hours, um, it's very difficult it's, it's very difficult for a healthcare plan to afford to, to meet CMS requirements around, around, you know, around wait time, handle time, uh, you know, total speed to answer, and out, Outsourcing those services to a BPO is really attractive because an outsourcer is going to be able to handle those calls with greater scale of time than a plan could, and it's going to it's going to be a huge cost avoider uh, for the healthcare plan. That's moving on to uh, to other spaces in operations, obviously enrollment, uh, it's it's commodity, high volume uh, of transactions, low complexity. This is a this is a great sweet spot. Uh, for, for a BPO to play. And the same thing on the provider side. Um, there's a lot of things that a, a BPO provider can do on behalf of the healthcare plan in the provider space. Mailroom. Again, you know, a, a lot of, of, of healthcare plans are now outsourcing their mailroom to BPO vendors. Uh, that includes not just the mailroom pieces itself, but even, even fabrication and, and production. Um, you know, producing ID cards, producing enrollment collateral, uh, sending out documentation, uh, and then OCR. Uh, so, so receiving documentation, and instead of having you know, data entry folks, you have a, an OCR supplemented by some kind of AI or machine learning that can look at a document and have it preset to say, hey, this is a 835, this is an 837. I know explicitly which spots on the sheet to grab content, convert it, and then enter it into the, into the system database. Um, so it's a, it's a huge uh, remover of labor. Um, some advanced plans already have this capability, but smaller plans don't. Uh, there are a lot of small plans that Catalyst talks to uh, that don't have OCR technology. So, so this, is, this is a place where um, you know, the, the, the healthcare plan can get a bump from a BPO provider and, and avoid costs and avoid unnecessary labor spend. On the clinical side, and thanks to economies of scale, uh, outsourced you know, care management solutions can deliver service and handle related uh, administrative tasks like documentation and billing for, for less than uh, the, the prescribed Medicaid, uh, Medicare or Medicaid budgeted fee. Healthcare plans can contract coordinators to act as extensions of the plan, uh, and they can engage members on behalf of the plan. Uh, they can do things like you know, build, care, uh, build care plans. They can make sure that appointments between the, the member and their, their respective providers happen. 
They can make sure that data is flowing both ways, or actually three ways from, from the member to the provider, uh, from the provider to the healthcare plan, and from the plan to the member. Um, and they can help ensure that the plan uh, nets a positive income from, from Medicare for services rendered. Uh, so, so this is a huge place, uh, you know, and I think this is a place from a BPO perspective that we're gonna see really, really significant growth over the next three to five years. I think, you know, as far as commodity services go, this is a huge place uh, for healthcare plans to start investigating uh, partners who can help them do this, uh, do this more efficiently and, and more cost in a more cost effective manner. The last one uh, in, in, in where can a BPO help is in the technology space. So technology is expensive. Uh, plans have to account for things like cost of an implementation. Uh, for those of you who have survived an implementation, we know that there is a cost uh, associated both in, in, in time and labor uh, where we have to remediate those things that weren't working at 100% after go live. Uh, there are costs associated with custom development. Uh, there are things that the system out of the box cannot do that the system absolutely has to have done. So we have to develop solutions that are not native to the solution or not native to, to the core platform. Uh, many of the, of the vendors uh, prescribe regular upgrades to their system and, and the plan has to achieve those upgrades. They have to meet those upgrade timeframes uh, from a contract perspective. And, and those upgrades can be very costly, uh, not just from a labor perspective, but from a schedule perspective, right? Uh, there's, you know, there are resource constraints and budget constraints. Um, and then lastly, from an IT perspective, there's, there's just the cost of day-to-day -day maintenance. <clears throat> With all of that said, just the cost of, kind of implementing and running the, the technology from a business side, you know, the question is, does the system really deliver on its promise, right? Is it really doing, is the vendor really doing what the platform, or I'm sorry, is the platform really doing what the vendor said it would do? Is it really making the business more efficient? Uh, and that's a question, right? Um, we invest a lot of money uh, as healthcare plans uh, into this technology, and sometimes that technology is not up to snuff, and that burden is in the hands of the plan itself. Uh, likewise, there are small plans that just cannot afford the expenses of, of buying you know, new technology. They can't afford you know, to, to move off an antiquated, possibly homegrown system, a system that's built in an archaic language. Um, you know, we see lots of plans saying, hey, you know, this was written, you know, 20, 30 more years ago, and it's still on COBOL. It, it, it's, you know, it's not using cloud-based technology. It, it's not using containers. It's not object-oriented. This is all linear, logical, spaghetti code, um, you know, that, and it's really difficult for the plan to manage. And just managing it has a huge cost. But that's where the BPO can help. Uh, many BPOs offer what's called BPAS or, or business process as a service, which means not only does the healthcare plan get the benefit of the, the, the labor that a BPO can provide, it also gets access to the BPO's technology stack. And, and, and in, in many cases, the BPO vendor has a very, very robust technology stack. Core platforms, they, they bring their own core platform to the table, which includes you know, the, the things that are really most important to the healthcare plan. Claims processing, you know, financial management, uh, membership management. And then there's other pieces of technology that are just expensive for the, for the healthcare plan to manage. Telephony is, is wildly expensive. Everything from, from just, just how do calls get into the call center through your ACD and your PBX, but then other things like your IVR, right? Um, can you get your IVR uh, to, to offload calls? So, so when you get that dreaded message on, on the phone when you're, when you're calling your healthcare plan, you know, it says, hey, you know, press one to get a status on your claim, right? And you press one and it says, you know, enter the, the, the member for which it's, this is for. So you enter the number and then, you know, on which date of service, you type in the date of service, it'll tell you this claim was paid, this claim was not paid. That's a huge, you know, time savings for a customer service rep not to have to do that service, right? But can a plan afford to implement something as expensive as an IVR? And, and small plans frequently cannot, which is where a BPO, because they provide service to so many 
uh, plans and, and provide so much call center work to other plans. They have the IVR. They can set up their IVR in, in a multi-tenant fashion, meaning every single healthcare plan has their own instance of that IVR. It's very, very economical for the plan to, to piggyback onto the, uh, onto the, onto the BPO. Uh, we talked about you know, OCRs and scanning. A lot of small plans don't have that capability. Uh, there's workflow and workflow management. How do you route work from one resource to another? Um, you know, uh, speaking as someone who, who has a little bit of background in process engineering, you know, we've seen plans manage process through email, right? It's, it's highly ineffective. It, it, it's suboptimal. There are lots of ways that errors can occur in, in using email as a workflow tool. They simply don't have another alternative. They can't afford a platform that does that. Um, population health management. You know, BPO vendors can bring utilization management tools to the table, care management tools to the table, disease management tools to the table. And then from a provider management perspective, which is increasingly a, a challenge that healthcare plans are facing is managing this, this, this constant changing uh, tide of provider data. You know, how do you manage the you know, modeling of contracts, the actual contracts in the system? How do you make sure that we're paying appropriately? Uh, managing your networks, managing credentialing. There's a lot of activities that happen here. We've seen healthcare plans manage provider data in Excel spreadsheets. And, and as you can imagine, that's, that's a highly inefficient way of approaching that as a solution. BPO providers can offer those tools as a service to their clients. So, so these are ways that, that you know, a BPO can make the lives of healthcare plan employees and, and, and then vicariously, the, the, the members who are seeking service from the healthcare plan, we can make those better. When we talk about you know, the, the BPO vendor providing technology, there, there's really two approaches, right? One is called a, a full system replacement or, or frequently referred to as a rip and replace. <clears throat> the, the other one uh, is, is less disruptive and, and it's, it's a modular approach. <clears throat> and, and, you know, Catalyst has seen, uh, just, just speaking from, from our perspective over the course of the last three to five years, an increased uh, appetite for, for healthcare plans to start looking at a more modular approach. Because in many cases, a lot of the things that a core platform does, it does well. But there are certain pain points where there's an aspect of the core platform that just doesn't work. So if we, if we replace what doesn't work with a singular module, um, it's less expensive. You're not, you're not ripping everything out and, and replacing it with a brand new platform. You're just adding a, a claims engine, right? Um, it's less disruptive to the business because entering in a new claims module will not have the same impact on, you know, on, you know, the underwriting team. It might not have the same impact on the call center. It might not have any impact on the enrollment team uh, because the only folks who are going to be affected by this are the claims team or maybe maybe some folks in the call center who have to look at claims, right? Uh, it, is, it is much less of a, of a kind of pervasive ripple through the organization, meaning that there's, there's less of a need for kind of an organizational change management program or, or a human adoption campaign. Um, and, and there's less need for, for widespread training across the organization. Uh, and it's a far more effective approach, right? Because what you're really doing is you're focusing on what the root cause issue is. You're focusing on what this thing can do and, and how it can do it right or better than focusing on everything. So, so something for, for healthcare plans to think about is when they're working with their BPO provider, maybe a full system replacement is necessary. If, if you're on an old technology, right? Let's replace the, old, the, the totality of the old technology. But if you're on a relatively modern platform, the BPO can work on that platform, but there's one aspect of your technology that is suboptimal, we can replace that one singular module. When we look at kind of the benefit of this, you know, obviously you know, there's an immediate benefit of reduction of, of PMPM capitation costs. Um, you know, we're, we're now looking at things from a performance-based, risk-based pricing perspective that the, that the BPO vendor will have skin in this game, right? If, if they don't find benefit for you uh, in these cases, uh, they're not compensated, right? They only get compensated on, on the dollars they help you find. Um, in many cases, that leads to healthcare plan business process improvement. Um, 
As a long-term benefit, we're looking at the reduction of overall medical costs, improved quality of care, reduction in risk to the healthcare plan, consistent and predictable outcomes, and lower administrative expenses. One of the great aspects of, of a of a, of a MLR optimization and premium enhancement BPO partnership is that if you can get one BPO vendor to kind of take on, you know, these, the DMEs, the specialty pharmacies, the, you know, the, the premium and, and payment integrity aspects, um, you actually reduce vendor fatigue, both in the organization and outside of the organization. And, and, I, and I referenced this just a second ago, these vendors are, are basically uh, in, on a gain share compensation model. Meaning, if they save you a dollar, they are entitled to some percentage of that dollar, but nothing else. So if they save you $10 million and they get 10%, they get a million dollars. If they do their work and they save you $0, you pay them $0, which, which is a very, very novel approach to, to, to handling this kind of a, a challenge inside the healthcare, uh, inside the healthcare system. How, how is this done, right? Because this is very, very different than a, than a labor technology perspective. Um, we look at identifying uh, where are there opportunities in your ecosystem by looking at claims data, by looking at capitation data, by looking at, at revenue data to find where could there be holes in there. <clears throat> we don't have to eat the apple in one bite. Right? We can work with, with the management team. Uh, the BPO vendor can work with the management team and say, what aspect of this do you want to go after first? Right? What, what is the lowest hanging fruit that we can tackle? How do we operationalize this so that we can work with the member community, the provider community, uh, and the healthcare plan to achieve these goals? And then we manage and measure. Right? So, so at that point, the BPO vendor goes off. They start going through the data. They start working with the members, the providers, the government, the healthcare plan to start recouping those, those dollars. And at the end of the cycle, we say, this is the success we achieved. These were, were places where there, you know, there was less benefit than we thought. What do we want to do next? And, 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 and the process continues to repeat itself. What are the risks associated with using a BPO service. We, we, we've talked about a lot of the benefits, right? There, there's cost benefits uh, from a savings perspective, from an avoidance perspective. We've talked about the operational benefits. We can just operate more efficiently. Uh, we've talked about the strategic benefits, right? We can, we can differentiate ourselves by focusing on our one thing and leaving commodity services to the BPO. And we can help drive improved member healthcare outcomes by outsourcing the clinical aspects to, to the plan. Um, how can the BPO do it better? Scales of economy uh, and expertise. What are the risks of picking that BPO vendor? So, so number one, first and foremost, probably in the minds of every chief operating officer or every business area lead is loss of control. Today, you know, I, I own claims. If I outsource claims, I lose control. That's a huge concern. How do you manage that? Constant communication with the vendor. Uh, you, you have pre-established uh, metrics in place. Uh, you have service level agreements in place. You, you tie the vendor to financially based service level agreements, right? You must process my claims at a 99.6% accuracy you must process my claims at a, at a throughput level of 10 claims per hour. Um, if you don't, you know, we will then deduct X percentage of your PMPM uh, revenue you know, from, from our payment to you. Uh, communication barriers, right? Especially as you talk about nearshore and offshore, uh, there are in some cases wide time zone differences, you know, 10 to 12 hours. Um, there are language barriers in some cases. These are, these are not trivial concerns that a healthcare plan can have. You want to make sure that you have a, a, a vendor that has some component that allows you to manage communication so that you, you, know, you can communicate with your partner and, and you can achieve the outcomes that you're looking to get and that communication is not a barrier to your success. Um, one of my favorites is, is unforeseen or hidden costs. Right? You signed up to do X with the vendor uh, a month in, 
you know, you say, hey, this thing has fallen off the plate. This is really kind of a big deal. And the vendor says, oh yeah, that's out of scope. It'll cost you more to do that, right? So in a lot of cases, you know, we recommend that, that you know, a lot of time, a lot of due diligence goes into really understanding, you know, what are you signing up for? And, and, and in some cases, what is out of scope is just as important as what is in scope in the contract, right? So, so the way you mitigate that is, is just through diligence before the contract is even signed. Privacy and security concerns. PHI is a huge asset to, to, to healthcare plans. Uh, it is a huge burden, honestly, to healthcare plans. Loss of data by way of a, a, a BPO vendor who is not SOC compliant, who doesn't have uh, resilient you know, security protocols in place for their IT infrastructure is a vulnerability to the healthcare plan, right? Because if a healthcare plan, uh, if their vendor has a breach, the healthcare plan is ultimately responsible. There, there is going to be an event, an adverse event as a result of a breach. Um, a healthcare plan that doesn't have experience managing remote teams. Um, you know, a lot of small healthcare plans, and, and in some cases, some large healthcare plans are very, very comfortable in, in managing teams that they can see, they can touch, they can walk out from their office and see their team. Um, <clears throat> vendor failure due to uh, delivery issues and delays. And then honestly, the quality of the outsourced product, right? So I sincerely want to say thank you. Um, I would say that over the last couple of years, uh, the, the life of the healthcare employee uh, has gotten, you know, much, much more complex, uh, much more demand on our time. So carving out an hour to, to learn about how a BPO can, can help your organization achieve cost savings and, and strategic objectives and, and help with clinical outcomes. Uh, thank you on behalf of myself, on behalf of, of my team at Catalyst. If you have questions or, or if you want to, if you're intrigued by, by these services and you want to talk to a subject matter expert, um, Lon Waterman, our, our Vice President of Sales uh, with Catalyst, uh, his contact information is here. Um, and then, of course, if you have just general information uh, and you want to contact Catalyst, that information is there as well.